الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى عليه وأصحابه أجمعين فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين وكان الله بكل شيء نليما يا أيها الذين آمنوا اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا وسبحوا وبكرة وأسيلا صدق الله العظيم praise be to Allah and peace and blessings of Allah be upon our beloved Prophet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam distinguished guests dignitaries elders my dear brothers and sisters in Islam I greet you all with the Islamic greetings and the greetings of peace and the greetings of all the prophets assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu may Allah's peace blessings and mercy be upon you all my name is Azhar Aziz and I'm a member of ISNA's executive council and it is my honor to be the MC for this inaugural session. I welcome you on behalf of Islamic Society of North America to its 43rd annual convention in this beautiful city of Chicago. As you can see on the backdrop, the theme for this year annual convention is achieving balance in faith, family, and community. We'll start our inaugural session with the recitation from the Holy Quran and I would like to request Khari Abdul Basit to come and recite a few verses from the Holy Quran in his beautiful voice. Khari Abdul Basit. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا واذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ كنتم أعداء فألف فألف بين قلوبكم فأصبحتم بنعمته فأصبحتم بنعمته إخوانا وكنتم على شفا حفرة من النار فأنقذكم منها كذلك يبين الله لكم آياته لعلكم تهتدون ولتكن منكم أمة يدعون إلى الخير ويأمرون بالمعروف ويأمرون بالمعروف وينهون عن المنكر وأولئك هم المفلحون صدق الله مولانا العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين جزاك الله خير الله سبحانه وتعالى says in the holy Quran ولتكن منكم أمة يدعون إلى الخير ويأمرون بالمعروف وينهون عن المنكر وأولئك هم المفلحون. Let there be a community among you advocating what is good, demanding what is right, and eradicating what is wrong. These are indeed the successful. In another place, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "خد أفلح من زكاها." Indeed, He succeeds who purifies his own self. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his narration said, Khairun nasi man yanfa'un nas. The best among you are those who are a source of benefit to others. A small journey which started in 1963 by few students as Muslim Student Association of US and Canada later on transformed into one of the most vibrant, forceful, and dynamic Muslim organizations in this continent, called as Islamic Society of North America, also known as ISNA. ISNA, alhamdulillah, the largest and the oldest Muslim organization in this continent, provides a unique opportunity every year that attracts around 30 to 40,000 people who come and listen to prominent scholars, leaders, and experts. It's always inspiring to see so many Muslims coming together under one roof, attending our annual convention. And alhamdulillah, the numbers are continuing to grow. ISNA annual convention gives our participants opportunities to dialogue with prominent scholars, leaders, and experts in various fields on important matters and issues related to faith and our community. These conferences reinforce our commitment towards our faith, guides us to be a better person, and give us motivation to reach out to others and educate them about Islam. As the vice chair of the program committee, I would like to thank all the committee members who spent a great deal of time and effort to come up with this year's program. As you know, to plan the program for our convention, our members spent several hours in physical meetings, follow-up phone calls, and emails. We have a wonderful program this year. We have many great and exciting speakers, and I'm pretty sure they en they'll enlighten us all with their talks. I strongly urge you to follow the program very closely, and once again, thank the wonderful team of our program committee. ISNA's vision is to be an exemplary and unifying Islamic organization in North America that contributes to the betterment of the Muslim community and society at large. Our mission is that ISNA is an association of Muslim organizations and individuals that provides a common platform for presenting Islam, supporting Muslim communities, developing educational, social, and outreach programs, and fostering good relations with other religious communities and civic and service organizations. This is one of the reasons that we all value ISNA so dearly and consider it as our mother organization. My dear brothers and sisters, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to a very prominent Islamic scholar and teacher. Ladies and gentlemen, the outgoing president of Islamic Society of North America, Sheikh Muhammad Noor Abdullah. Takbir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Nahmadu wa nasta'inu, nasta'hdiyeh. Wa nashadu an la ilaha illallah wa hadahu la sharika lah. Wa nashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد. We start praising Allah Almighty. We send peace and blessing upon Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Jesus, Moses, Abraham, and all the prophets. We thank Allah that who brought us here is weekend to come together as a family and share our knowledge, our experience, and support each other. I was elected five years ago as the president just one week before September 11th. And it was really a test and a trial for all of us as Americans, definitely as Muslims in North America. But with the help of Allah Almighty, the, my two vice president, Dr. Ingrid Marson, Sayyid Imtiaz, Secretary General, Brother Sayyid Ham Saeed, Brother Ahmed Hattab, Shura members and others, 
we were able to work together to make ISNA as it is, a balanced, mainstream voice for Muslims in North America. It was an easy war. Still, we're under attack. But with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, working together, we are able to achieve a lot. Just in this evening, we have honorable guests with us in this platform here. This is, wasn't there five years ago. This is the result of a lot of people hard war to build bridge with the government, civil organizations, so that we as Muslim community came have that kind of communication so make America a better place for everyone. As Muslims, we choose America as our home. So this is our home. And a person defend and protect his home. So the safety of America is our duty as Muslims. And we're doing that as a religious duty. To say it very clear, very loud. That's why it hurt when you look at you as you are a stranger, where you come from. <laughs> so that's why with the hard work, we will make these things work together. Nothing is perfect, but people should never give up hope, should keep working together, and God willing, we will see better days coming, inshallah ta'ala. As American Muslims, we are a diverse community. As I mentioned in my khutbah, over 50 nations are in this gathering here, and that enriching our nation is America. And we say that America is a land of immigrant. Everyone is immigrant here. The only who are people who are native are Native Americans. The rest are coming from other places. And that's why this is the greatness of this country. People have choices, have opportunities, building bridge, work together, inshallah will make it a better place. As I mentioned that we face a lot of challenges. It was very hard to bring Muslims together. I know that the first year, second year, we were scared to come to Isna. They were scared. But alhamdulillah, again, we are giving that trust to our Muslim community. I would like to thank everyone, our community, all our staffs who work very hard I would like to thank Chicago community for the support, the steering committee, the massages, organizations who have hundreds of volunteers working months before this event. Still they're working today here. They are the ones who care for our being and comfortable, having everything there. We thank them. And may Allah bless everyone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them for the hard work. I would like to take, take this opportunity to thank also uh, our guest, Deputy Secretary of Defense, Gordon England, for coming with us this evening, sharing his views, experience, and showing that we all care and we show that we as Muslim community and the government, we have to work together for our well-being. And that's why ISNA reach out. Not only government people, interface people and everyone, so we say that we're all together in it. And together we can make it. We work together to make America a better place, inshallah ta'ala, and we can fight injustice, extremism everywhere, inshallah ta'ala. I'd like to thank also Alina Kowalski, who is Deputy Assistant Secretary for Educational and Cultural Affairs, Mr. Mark Ward, Deputy Assistant Administrator for Bureau of Asia and Near Eastern USAID, and David Richardson for Boy Scout. They are all here. They came to participate in this great event. Again, 
I would like to say this work we're doing, as we say in our tradition, it is for our year coming. We work here in this life, but our aim that Almighty God will bless everyone. And everyone have something to do. And don't look down to whatever you can do from good deeds, do it. In the beautiful hadith, Prophet Muhammad said that if the hour going to stop and you have a tree, you can plant that tree, do it. And to grow a palm tree, it takes at least three to five years to bring the fruits. So you may not see the fruits, but I'm planting that tree so my children, my grandchildren, or everyone eat from that tree, that fruit, I will get the reward. Long way after I leave this world. So this work like that, everyone has put that seed, water it, give it, take care of it, and the fruits, you can see it, or your children or grandchildren. That is the good work. And that's why everyone of us is that farmer. And that seed can be a good word, you say. Can be a good action, you can say. Can be just comfort to someone who is really stressed. May Allah make us keys for good things. May Allah bless us. May Allah guide us. My special dua to incoming president, Dr. Ingrid Madsen, brother Imam Majid, and our vice president from Canada, and the Shura. May Allah be with them, help them, ease their load, and protect them, give them the sabr, the patience, the wisdom to carry this message, this responsibility. And everyone, please share us that prayer. Subhanakallah hamdik. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum wa Takbir. Before I invite uh, our next speaker, I want to quote Frank Outlaw. He once said, watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. This year, Muslim youth of North America, also known as MENA, is celebrating its 21 years. Please welcome its national president, Omar Siddiqui. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, it's, I just wanted to start by saying that it's really nice to be back again. I got in this morning and Wallahi Isna is like a big family reunion. Um, you know, when I was at Juma prayer, I just got stopped by probably 20 people and it's just really beautiful to be here. And there's a lot of barakah in these gatherings. Our scholars say that when we get together like this in love for one another, it's like a feast for our souls. So everybody enjoy it, inshallah. Um, this year, our theme for Mina for the program is holding fast to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason we chose this is so that everybody knows that despite the tests, despite the challenges, the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there for us, and it's always there for us to cling on to, and it's the only rope for us that is our support. And basically, I just wanted to talk to you about the progress that we've made in the last year. I'm here for the second time. Um, MINA has been making strides in the last year in terms of trying to create an infrastructure for the organization moving forward. And basically our new approach is inshallah to assess the needs of specific communities that are out there that need help and to work with the people in those communities so that we can subsequently address their concerns. Um, what I just want, I just wanted to make a request to everybody that inshallah, you know, if you are from a community that has some youth development that needs work, inshallah, I'm here, I'm available. Um, I can give you my email address or anything afterwards, inshallah. We want to work with you, we want to help improve the state of the youth uh, in North America, inshallah. So, you know, just make dua for us, make dua for the organization. Uh, we thank ISNA for everything they do for us every year, day in, day out. So just keep us in your duas, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Once a wise man said, creativity is like driving a car at night. You never see further than your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. 
Creativity provides solutions, and solutions are the path to progress. Being creative in any capacity, in any situation, day by day, project by project, one phase after another, is a great way to move forward along. Be yourself, be creative, be a source of solutions. Talking about solutions, please welcome the president of the Association of Muslim Scientists and Engineers, a very successful entrepreneur and Majlis Ashura member of ISNA, Dr. Khurshid Qureshi. Assalamu alaikum. Ahlan wa sahlan marhaba. I think welcome to this city of lights. This is a beautiful city and we all come and enjoy every year. I represent Association of Muslim Scientists and Engineers. This association was established in the traditions of Muslim scientists and engineers who discovered so many discoveries between the 8th and the 15th century. Some of those names, like Khwarzami, Al-Biruni, Ibn Sina, they were the one, they were the shining examples of the Muslim culture. Between the 8th and the 14th century, when whole Europe was sleeping, they were in dark ages. There were plagues, there were disease, and no education. Muslims went to Spain and Italy. They established the universities, colleges, and the institutions of higher learning where they spread the light all around the world. The students, like they come to United States today, from all over the world, they used to go to Spain, Sicily, Damascus, and Baghdad to learn about the scientific fields. Muslims from their back homes in last century and this century have started migrating to the Western world where they have found an excellent refuge. They have not only become the builders of the buildings, but they also become the builder of the bridge between the East and the West. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to keep on giving the examples of the Dr. Fazlur Rahman Khan, who invented the tubular structure buildings all the modern high-rise buildings, you see them. And the biggest examples is the Sears Towers and John Hancock, where the people were able to make and build 100 stories building from his inventions. Our second generation of Muslims who have been born and raised here, they are very much involved in the Silicon Valley. They are building the companies. Muslims from the profession of aerospace to medicinal sciences, they are really the true Muslims. And this is the other side of the Islam, which is not blowing yourself up, not killing yourself up, but giving something worth in return. Again, I am very thankful to you that you came to this convention. Our honorable guests, we are really thankful coming down here, and you'll be able to see the other side of it. Islam. Thank you very much and God bless you. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, Kullu nafsin zayqatul maut, every soul shall taste death. Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajeun, to you we belong to, to you we shall return. My dear brothers and sisters, while we are celebrating 43 years of our presence, accomplishments, and contributions in North America, on a very sad note, this year we also mourn the loss of some of the prominent leaders, activists, and supporters of ISNA. On the top of the list is Dr. Dillawaz Siddiqui, Brother Sayyid Salman, Brother Aftab Ahmad Khan, Brother Nazir Baik, Brother Muzaffar Parthoma, and Brother Ahmad Hussain. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them a place in Jannah and give patience to their near and dear ones. And I urge you to make Dua for their maghfirah. I would also like to take this opportunity to remind you 
to remember all those who serve the Muslim community in this country. We all owe them big time. You develop courage by surviving difficult times and challenging adversity. I know our next two speakers have displayed these qualities during the past natural calamities and disasters by providing relief, help, and assistance, especially during the devastating earthquake that struck Pakistan and Kashmir. Let me introduce the president of the Association of Pakistani Physicians of North America, popularly known as APNA. Please welcome Dr. Abdul Rashid Paraja. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. Uh, I represent the Association of Physicians of Pakistani Descent. Uh, this includes uh, people like me who came here as immigrants and became uh, citizens. It also includes our children who are born, raised, educated, either in the U.S. medical schools or abroad. We actually are a strong 10,000 Pakistani descent physicians practicing in this country, in each and every corner of this country. Our organization is a charitable, caring, and a professional organization. Through the spirit to our profession, we have shown and come forward to every calamity that has occurred in the recent past. Whether it be in the United States, whether it be Katrina, whether it be tsunami, the earthquake of Iran, or the recent earthquake of Pakistan. Uh, in the earthquake of Pakistan, we volunteered 200 of our own physicians that worked in the earthquake area. We also had a collaboration with the MASH unit in Azad Kashmir, where our physicians from here volunteer to work in the Zafrabad area. So uh, Muslims, we don't call our physicians as Muslim physicians of North America, but the majority, over 95% of our members are Muslims. So the concerns that Muslims have in this country are also the concerns of our membership. We are concerned about some racial profiling. It would be a mishap for me not to mention something that are going so good for us in this country, but there are some things that are not going so well for us, and we have to mention those. My son, who is an ophthalmologist, recently was asked by a senior ophthalmologist that he has a Pakistani-born American ophthalmologist who he likes very well. He respects his profession. He respects his integrity. He respects his ethics of work. But he has another partner who is not Muslim and who has a problem whether he should take him into his practice or not. This is very concerning to all of us, all American citizens, that now this racial profiling by some people have gone to the point where it's interfering with our own profession. I would urge the government that at this time we can do, you know, I can do a practice in my area for 40 years. Everybody likes me, everybody loves me, everybody likes my work, but a far out bomb somewhere just overrides all my work in my community. And things don't change in uh, by, by us working at it. It's the job of the government to please clear this racial profiling that we have that is being developed at this, st this stage 
so that we all, as American Muslims, can work for the development of this country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Paracha. Please welcome the President of the Islamic Medical Association of North America, Imana, Dr. Sheikh and Hassan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat. On behalf of the Islamic Medical Association of North America, I welcome you to this convention. This is the forum in which we will renew old acquaintances. We will, inshallah, establish new ones. We will share knowledge. We will reinforce our existing knowledge that we have. We will revive the dormant knowledge in us that is good for mankind. And we will gain new information. But it does us no good to have knowledge and not put it in practice. When we sit in the lecture halls and we become invigorated, my brothers and sisters in Islam and friends, let us continue that after we leave here and let us keep it up for a long, long time to come. Just very briefly, let me tell you a little bit about what the Islamic Medical Association of North America has been doing and plan to continue to do, and this will take all but 30 seconds. We have been involved with medical relief worldwide, including right here in North America. We have developed position papers on various medical aspects, including medical ethics. We serve as local resource people to the local masjids. We serve as resource people to the United States medical establishment as a whole. Now, medical students, Muslim medical students, when they graduate from medical schools, they take the oath of the Muslim physicians. We will, inshallah, promote research, education, and collegiality. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us his wisdom and his guidance and forgive us of all the shortcomings that we have. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, وَحْسِنُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And do good, Allah loves the good doers. So jazakallah khair for all your good work. Robert Brault once said, I value the friend who for me finds time on his calendar. But I cherish the friend who for me does not consult his calendar. So today we have some very important and distinguished dignitaries who took the time out of their very busy schedule and we are all very honored by their presence. To introduce the first distinguished guest, I would like to request Dr. Loe Safi, Executive Director of ISNA Leadership Development Center, to come to the podium and introduce our next distinguished guest. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and good afternoon. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you a person of a great character, achievements, and a friend of our community. Gordon England, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, um, is, is a native of Baltimore. He earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Maryland and started a career as an elect electrical engineer. He later entered, uh, earned a ma master's degree from Texas Christian University and rose to become president of some of America's biggest corporations. Secretary England has a distinguished career both as businessman and public servant. He was twice confirmed by the Senate as the Secretary of the Navy. First, 2001, as the 72, the 70, uh, second Secretary of Navy and Two, uh, two years later as the 73rd Secretary of the Navy. Therefore become the second person to serve twice in the position and the first in history to serve back to back terms. Now don't ask me who was the first one. In 2003, he was confirmed as the first Deputy Secretary of the newly established Department of Homeland Security. Last year, because of his leadership, he was tapped to become the 29th 
Deputy Secretary of Defense, Secretary England, is a legendary for his energy and engagement. In addition to his many duties at the Pentagon, he meets regularly in Washington with many diplomats who represent Muslim nations around the world, in addition to other nations. And uh, we do appreciate that he really said, I will stay here and don't worry about my, my calendar because I want to meet with the Muslim community. Um, last June, and that's something of, of interest to all of us, he presided over the dedication of the first Islamic prayer center to be established on a military base in the United States. The, um, the Quintaco Marine Corps base, uh, Islamic, uh, Islamic prayer center was dedicated this June. Um, Gordon England is a man of honor, intelligence, and integrity who has given his time and energy to serve America. So please help me welcome Secretary England. Friends, fellow Americans, and people of faith, good afternoon, and thank you to uh, Dr. Louis Safi for the fine introduction. I thank you for your friendship also, and a special thanks to Sheikh Mohammed Nur Abdullah and Dr. Ingrid Matson for their leadership and for the opportunity, the invitation to join the Islamic Society of the North American Conference today. I also want to thank them for the delightful lunch we had today with the leadership of the society. We just had a wonderful opportunity to dialogue and discuss today, and I thank them very, very much for that wonderful opportunity. I do want to tell you it is a profound honor for me to be here with you today. And being here, I represent all the men and women in the United States military and all the civilians who serve America in the Department of Defense and throughout the United States government. In every single generation, patriotic citizens of America and our friends and allies have stepped forward to defend freedom and liberty. And I want to take a moment to thank all the military veterans and all those who currently serve, because I'll tell you, we all owe them a profound debt of, gra of uh, gratitude. The themes of this conference, faith, family, and community, are in many ways the very foundation of this great nation. These basic values of daily life are the building blocks for the high and noble ideals of freedom and liberty that this nation has proclaimed since its birth. If you go back to the Declaration of Independence, written during the time of the American Revolution, it declares the right for everyone to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. More recently, in 1941, when the nation was under threat, and this time from the forces of fascism, President Roosevelt spoke with hope of a world founded on four essential human freedoms. The freedom of speech and expression, the freedom of every person everywhere to worship God in his own way, the freedom from one and the freedom from fear. And certainly all of us, everyone at this conference, have benefited from these fundamental freedoms because freedom creates opportunity. Freedom is the bedrock that, how, that has allowed so many of us here today to build successful careers. Doctors, lawyers, professors, business executives, government leaders, many, many others. And over the course of America's history, many people have made great sacrifices to protect this precious freedom. And they did it for your benefit and for my benefit. During my introduction, Dr. Safi said that I was from Baltimore. I was born in, in Baltimore, Maryland, 
And on the 7th of December, Pearl Harbor, I was four years old. I was born in 1937, so I was four years old on December the 7th. And I still remember as a very young boy in Baltimore, I remember the blackouts and the civil defense wardens and all those things that were going on during World War II, if you happen to be a young boy at home during the war. In my neighborhood where we played, uh, I lived right in the city itself in a row house in Baltimore City. And right in my neighborhood where all the streets came together, there was a very small area of, of grass and all the uh, children would play on this little grass square. And we were playing, it was 1945, when workers came one day and they erected a small sign, like a street sign, but a little sign on the pole in the middle of the square. And the sign said, Francis Callahan Jr. Square. And I remember it very, very vividly. And I didn't know, none of us children who who lived in Baltimore and were playing on the square knew what that meant, but it turned out my parents told me it was called the Francis Callahan Jr. Square because the Callahans lived on the corner of the square and their son, Francis Callahan Jr., had been killed recently on Iwo Jima, and so the family named the square after their son. Now, the reason I mention these experiences, my experiences as a boy, is that the courage of our military in those days and the will and the determination of the United States and our friends and allies made the life that I've lived possible. And I expect many of your lives also because it was freedom that triumphed in World War II. Now when the war ended, people felt entitled to a period of peace, but history did not cooperate. Rather, freedom found itself threatened again, this time by communism in Korea, which was the first bloody battle of a Cold War. And in those days, President Dwight D. Eisenhower said, the history of free men is never written by chance, but by choice, by their choice. And during the Cold War, the long time of the Cold War, the political leaders of the free world made the choice to stand together. They disagreed about many things, but they did choose to put security and freedom and liberty first. And the shared will and the commitment of the United States and our friends and allies won the day for liberty. After the Cold War ended, most people again expected a peace dividend, but instead on 9-11, terrorists turned civilian airlines into guided missiles and 3,000 people of 60, of 60 different nationalities died that day. And I believe I know why 30,000 people died that day. 30,000 people died that day because the terrorists did not know how to kill 30,000 or 300,000 or 3 million. But they would have if they could have, and they're still trying. The terrorists who threaten us know no national boundaries. All who love liberty and freedom are fair game for their brutality and aggression. Terrorists, with their distorted ideology, are intimidating countries and regions and religions and peaceful people throughout the world. No nation is immune. No people are immune. These terrorists offer no hope for the future. Rather, theirs is a bloody campaign against societies that do not fit their narrow view. And this is the fundamental challenge of our time. And just like World War II and just like the Cold War, once again, the course of history will be decided by the choices that people make, whether the terrorist path of violence or the far better path of peace, development, and freedom. It's also a time of choice for nations of the world. America and our key partners are choosing to help lead the way towards greater freedom in parts of the world that have known far too little of it. 
President Bush has said we will act boldly in freedom's cause. This is not the time for America to pull back from the world. This is a time for America's bold leadership and for international cooperation and resolve. While military action against those extremists who do others harm is a necessary part of that resolve, it is not sufficient. Another important part of the solution is clearly demonstrating and making known in no uncertain terms that there is no contradiction between the peaceful religion of Islam and America's values and principles. Muslims, an integral part of the fabric of America, are successful in building careers, raising families, and strengthening their communities. You, my friends, are the shining example for the rest of the world. One way that you can make a profound difference in the fundamental struggle of the 21st century is by ensuring that your voice is heard you can help bridge the cultural gap, both here in America and in abroad. And I challenge the Islamic Society of North America to be even more active in reaching out to others and sharing your values, sharing your beliefs, and sharing your experiences. America wants you to be more involved. Reaching out to people around the world, understanding their concerns, offering partnership and support, and extending the promise of freedom is a noble mission, and it is a mission that involves all of us. At the national level, America builds important relationships through a variety of mechanisms, such as security cooperation arrangements and free trade agreements like the ones we have with Australia and Chile, Bahrain, Jordan, and Morocco. At the personal level, Americans build relationships through business partnerships and international scientific conferences and academic and cultural exchanges, the kinds of things many of you do daily in your professional lives. As the Holy Quran says, O oh mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes that ye may know each other. Accept this challenge to reach out more aggressively, to extend freedom and opportunity, and to build a stronger and more interconnected world. Yesterday, I went to Walter Reed Hospital with Ambassador Samir. He's the ambassador from Iraq to the United States. And together we visited the severely wounded, many of whom had lost arms and legs in their commitment to a free Iraq. The ambassador went to Walter Reed Hospital to express his appreciation for the soldier's service to the Iraqi people but unfortunately, not all of our service men and women come home. One person who reached out but did not come home was Ayman Taha, a Berkeley graduate, a budding academic economist, and a native of Sudan. A few years ago, he decided to take a break from his graduate studies to join the U.S. Special Forces. He was patriotic, he believed in the mission, and he wanted to serve. His unit was deployed to Iraq. Earlier this year, Ayman was preparing a cache of munitions for demolition when it exploded, and he was killed. His father was a PhD who worked for the World Bank, and what he said afterwards was profound. His son was a devout Muslim who believed that the message of Islam is very simple, to believe in God and to do good deeds. America is grateful to this remarkable family for their service and sacrifices. 
and their faith in God and in this great nation. That family is very much like the Callahan family of Baltimore when I was a young boy. President Bush said, there is only one force of history that can break the reign of hatred and resentment and expose the pretensions of tyrants and reward the hopes of decent and tolerant, and that is the hope of human freedom. Today, we have the opportunity to draw on our own strong faith, our families and our communities to help extend the promise of hope and freedom to others. It is not enough simply to appreciate the blessings of liberty. As President Ronald Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. This may be the defining moment for future generations. We all share the responsibility to participate in the noble cause of extending the promise of freedom. This is not a time to be timid. Rather, this is a time to make our voices heard. Making your voice heard is important and necessary to defeat the terrorist distorted ideologies. I do thank, I do thank each of you and your families for your patriotism, for your commitment to your communities, for what you do every day to leave a more peaceful and prosperous world for our children and for our grandchildren. God bless you. Salam. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your very valuable thoughts. Honorable Gordon England, Deputy Secretary of Defense. My dear brothers and sisters, as you all can see, we have a very high level of dignitaries and guests. So you can see we have some extra security today. We apologize for any inconvenience this may have caused to any of our participants. We en please do enjoy the rest of the evening. We have a wonderful program for the coming next three days. Our next distinguished speaker currently serves as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Professional and Cultural Exchanges in the Departments of St Department of State's Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs. She came to the Department of State in June of 2003 to establish a new office to oversee and manage the President's Middle East Partnership Initiative and served as director. Prior to her appointment at the Department of State, she served as the founding director of the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University since December 2000. She has received several awards and citations she is the 2001 recipient of the Presidential Distinguished Rank Award for Senior Executive Service and a 99 recipient of the Presidential Meritorious Rank Award for Senior Executive Service. Her other awards include two Secretary of Defense Meritorious Civilian Service Awards for her contributions. She is a graduate of the University of Chicago where she received her bachelor's degree in history in 1977 and a master's degree in the international relations with a concentration in the Middle East in 1980. She speaks French and has studied Arabic and Hebrew. It's my honor to introduce Alina Romanski, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Educational and Cultural Affairs. Thank you very much for that very gracious introduction. And uh, let me take a moment here to congratulate Dr. Ingrid Matson as ISNA's first uh, woman president and also to congratulate your new <laughs> vice president, Imam Majid. 
It's a real pleasure for me to, frankly, be back in my uh, hometown, Chicago. I grew up here. It's also a great pleasure for me to come back and also speak to uh, ISNA. Uh, I did so about a year or two ago in Dallas, and it's always uh, wonderful for me to come back and, and speak to this organization. So thank you for that opportunity. Um, I also want to pick up on some of Secretary England's themes that he uh, put forward, and specifically the challenge for the American Muslim community to um, hear their voices and to um, engage with us and to engage overseas. I noticed your, you have quite an agenda for the weekend, and I noticed specifically on Sunday that you will be uh, looking and discussing in a number of panels the ways in which the American Muslim community can engage overseas. I'm also, uh, like Secretary England, was quite um, moved by the theme of the conference this year, uh, balancing and achieving balance in faith, family, and community. Um, and I would like to echo this con concept of balance in my remarks and to put forward this notion of how international dialogue and educational exchange can and must perform a vital balancing act when conflict and confrontation appear so pervasive around the world today. Specifically in my remarks, I'd like to focus on how the Department of State is engaging with both the Arab and the Muslim Americans to play a constructive and proactive role in our public diplomacy efforts around the world. It is already a good deal of engagement, and we are committed to increasing it over the coming months and years. Through the direct involvement of the Arab and uh, Muslim American uh, and organizations such as ISNA and others, we hope to see a level of interaction with our own American Muslim communities and those around the world that is unprecedented. I think as we gaze out at a forbidding Middle East landscape at this moment, a fragile ceasefire in Lebanon, an impasse between Israel and the Hamas-led Palestinian Authority, continuing sectarian violence in, in Iraq, and Iran's defiance of the Security Council's demand that it live up to its non-proliferation commitments and end its nuclear enrichment program, it would seem appropriate to ask several obvious questions. Can this really be the right moment to talk about educational exchange program and other aspects of our public diplomacy? Should we be asking about ways of building bridges to share knowledge and strengthening mutual understanding? Our answer must be absolutely, unequivocally, now more than ever we need to be doing this. The patient The patient work of public diplomacy and dialogue are more important than ever before to bring a measure of balance and hope to the international scene and to a better understanding between our families, our communities, and our nations. The personal and institutional linkages that we have nurtured for years and for decades and the new people-to-people -people initiatives that the Bush administration is launching now, all will become powerful forces tomorrow. They will be forces for understanding, for renewal, for building any kind of peace, for achieving the balance that is vital to our freedom and security as individuals, as Americans, and as citizens of the world. And this is why we are working hard, even in this difficult environment, to protect and expand the wide range and increasing diversity of our educational and cultural diplomacy efforts around the world. Indeed, our commitment to international exchange remains as strong as ever. And that is why, during the conflict in Lebanon, for example, against many odds, we, were, uh, we succeeded in getting close to 27 Lebanese high school students out of Lebanon brought them to the United States so they could join the
There's 600 other colleagues who we bring every year for a one-year exchange to be in our high schools in the United States. For all of these reasons, President Bush has recognized that public diplomacy is an integral tool of U.S. foreign policy. The administration has increased funding for all of our exchange programs substantially. It's up $70 million in, the, in uh, last year's budget, and we're asking for another increase of $48 million for this year's budget. Under Secretary uh, of State for Public Diplomacy, Karen Hughes, has call, called upon all Americans to help in supporting our strategic public objectives, and let me just quickly tick them off. The first one is clearly to offer a vision of hope to people in the Middle East and throughout the world that is rooted in our commitment to freedom, democracy, religious tolerance, and rule and law. The second is that we must isolate and marginalize the extremists who seek to exploit religion as a justification for violence and terrorism. And finally, we need to join together to foster a community of common interests and shared values. One paradox of public diplomacy, especially in the education and uh, exchange arena, is that much of it is not terribly visual or even very visible. These exchanges, in partnership with national and local volunteer organizations, often operate below the radar of newspaper headlines, cable TV, or even the growing blog sphere, for that matter. But we know from long experience and personal testimony that exchanges work, that they are powerful, and they are transformational. So let me just take a few moments uh, to, uh, to talk to you a bit about those quiet exchange and institutional linkages that we've been undertaking the past year, particularly those involving the American Muslim community. The State Department is reaching out in a wide variety of ways to American Muslims, to students, to imams, to social entrepreneurs, academics, professionals, to hear their thoughts and perspectives, as well as to get ideas on how to better exchange uh, com the, our communities here and abroad. And in fact, we have had several meetings at the State Department at various levels with representatives from ISNA and other communities who are uh, organizations who are represented here. We know that the American Muslim community has played and will continue to play a vital role as we talk about what is taking place overseas. That's why it is so important to reach out to organizations such as yours and others. We've also worked hard to make our exchange programs more strategic, and that that, uh, by that I mean that we focus a great deal of time on, and resources on audiences from Arab and Muslim countries, as well as Muslim and ethnic religious minorities in other nations. We're tailoring our programs to reach young people and those who have the greatest influence on them from outside of their parents, teachers, religious leaders, scholars, and journalists. We've launched programs this year that bring journalists to the United States. We've launched a program that bring women to mentor with our Fortune 500 leaders. And we have started and launched a national security language initiative. All of these programs are designed to engage key influencers in the United States and overseas and to promote a better understanding between Americans and the Muslim world. In the last two years alone, we've supported four major exchange programs that promote interfaith dialogue with overseas Muslim participants in Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and the United States. This project uh, devoted to Islamic life in the United States and organized by the University of Louisville introduced 27 clerics, religious scholars, and community af uh, activists to ISNA and to other organizations. And this contributed, this exchange program contributed significantly to the establishment of the Iqbal International Institute for Research, Education, and Dialogue that's based in Pakistan. We're also very pleased to note that several institutions also responded to 
our recent request to continue these types of programs. And while we haven't formally announced them, I will say that your organization, ISMA, is among those who will be continuing to work with us. I also want to thank very much ISMA for a very important role in supporting one of our longest and um, most important international exchange programs, and that is the International Visitor Leadership Program. This brings more than 4,000 participants to the United States every year. We've seen an expansion in the visitors from predominantly Muslim countries, and I have to thank ISMA for being part of the volunteer organizations and other organizations in the United States who have shared and been part of explaining, introducing, and opening their hearts and homes to the international visitors who we bring here. I want to also uh, highlight one final program, and that is reaching out to American Muslims to speak to Muslims in other parts of the world about identity, life in America, and balancing culture and faith. Under Secretary Hughes, we're launching a new public diplomacy initiative. It's called the Citizen Dialogue. It's an initiative that has allowed um, Muslim Americans to share the diversity and reality of their American experience with Muslim communities around the world. The first delegation traveled to Europe, where they visited Germany, Netherlands, and Denmark. In that delegation was a student, a doctor, a federal employee, and an imam who took part in youth symposiums, town hall meetings, and various community outreach activities. We're hoping that we send, we'll send out another um, delegation in, in, in very short order to Pakistan and to Kyrgyzstan. In closing, we are engaged in this work not simply for weeks or months, but of years and decades. And from the State Department's perspective, our challenge is not only to address the policy or the political differences that may divide us and our nations, but to promote the fundamental shared values of democracy, human dignity, and individual opportunity that unite us. We must continue to hold fast to these ideals and remember that these truths as we negotiate the challenges of our time. And we call, and we call upon uh, your organizations and your community to help us as Americans in doing that, and we very much appreciate uh, your involvement and your willingness to open your homes and also your organizations to working with us on that. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to coming back and updating all of you on what we are doing, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with you in the future. Thank you very much. This was Alina Ramonsky, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Educational and Cultural Affairs. Uh, very quickly, our next speaker, um, I had an opportunity to meet him this morning at breakfast, and uh, he is the Deputy Assistant Administrative Bureau for Asia and Near East at USAID. Please welcome Mr. Mark Ward. It's short, he says. All right. I admire your tenacity hanging in there. Let me congratulate the leadership of ISNA, Dr. Matson. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. It's wonderful for USAID to get an opportunity to talk to you about what we do overseas. This is a first for us, and I hope if I do a decent job up here, maybe we'll be invited back. So maybe you can tell me later what sort of remark, what sort of, you know, how they're reacting to my remarks. But I wanted to shift the focus a little bit overseas where we work, because you're taxpayers, and without the taxes that you're paying, you are paying them, right? <laughs> we, weren't, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we're doing overseas, and I want to tell you a little bit about that. USAID, the United States Agency for International Development, we're a small independent agency. We work very closely with the State Department, with the Defense Department in Washington, and mostly overseas. 
We have offices in more than 70 countries around the world. By our count, there are 49 countries in the world that are predominantly Muslim in their population, and we have full-time offices in almost 30 of those. I'm a career foreign service officer, and I've spent most of my career overseas working in Muslim nations, mostly in Pakistan. If you visit one of our offices overseas, and I know some of you have, the first thing that you would notice is there's very few people that look like me. There's very few foreign service officers. What we principally rely on in our missions overseas is foreign service nationals, experts from that country that we hire, experts in all disciplines who are really, don't tell anybody I said this, the brains of the outfit overseas. And we, we like them to stay with us for a very long career, but sometimes they don't, and they end up in very senior positions of leadership in their countries. They end up in the government, in academia, and in science and civil society, and we couldn't do our job without them. We're also very proud of the work that we do overseas with the religious leadership. In countries like Bangladesh, where we get great advice from the imams about how to talk to communities about the importance of education and public health, about the work that we do in Indonesia, particularly after the tsunami up in Aceh, where we work with the Alama to help communities prioritize their needs for rebuilding. We, we're very thankful to the religious leadership in Afghanistan who did such a wonderful job working with us through a program with the Asia Foundation to get the vote out in the national elections, um, what was that, almost two years ago. We're also very proud of the work that we do with indigenous organizations overseas. Some people think, oh, USAID, all they do is spend their money on American NGOs and American contractors overseas. Sometimes we have to in a place like Afghanistan where there isn't the capacity because of years of war. There will be again someday. But if you look at the way we do our work in other countries throughout the Islamic world, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in the Philippines, in Mindanao, where we rely on local NGOs and their tremendous capacity to get the work done more effectively. Now, there are risks with that, and we'll talk about some of that tomorrow when we talk about gift giving in this post-9-11 world. And I just want to assure everybody here that one of the virtues of us having a permanent presence in these countries around the world is that we know who to work with, who we can safely work with. And I can assure you that none of our funds for the Pakistan earthquake went to the, the Jamaat Udawa organization that's in so much trouble over what happened in the UK recently. All right, two or three minutes, I'm going to cut this short. Um, let me just again thank you very much. I hope particularly with all the young people here. I think this has been fantastic, seeing so many young people attending this kind of a convention. And I hope every one of them will come by the booth that USAID and the State Department have set up outside and learn and ask some questions about a career with us in the Foreign Service or the Civil Service. Um, you are our future, and we'd love to have you join us. So again, how did I do? All right. So may, maybe I'll... Uh, Maybe I'll get invited back next year. Come and see us and learn more about us. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Between one and 10, you got 10, and 10 being the best. So thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is from the Bo Boy Scouts of America, Mr. David Richardson. Please welcome David. I had a 45 minute presentation, but uh, based on that, what the heck? All right. A little boy waits for the most important person in his life to come home from work, and that's his father. And he runs to the window, and he looks out the window, and his dad drives up, and he's had one of those kind of days that we've all had. And he grabs a newspaper and sits down and begins to read. And a little boy runs and jumps in dad's lap and says, come on, dad, let's go play. And Dad says, son, I'm tired. Let me read my paper. 
and the little boy realizes that in just a couple of hours he'll not be, be able to see his dad, but until tomorrow night. And so he runs and jumps in dad's lap and says, come on, dad, let's go play. And dad takes an advertisement from the newspaper. It's a picture of the United States. And he tears it into a lot of little pieces and says, here, son, go put this puzzle together. And the little boy sits down and begins to put the puzzle together. And dad sits back and begins to read his newspaper. But in just a minute, the little boy is in dad's lap again. Come on, dad, let's go play. And dad says very angrily now, son, I thought you were going to put the puzzle together. And the little boy said, I did, dad. See? And there at dad's feet was a picture of the United States, all the states exactly where they ought to be. Every border, absolutely right. And he said, gee, son, that's amazing. How did you do that? And with the wisdom of eight years, the little boy said, it was easy, Dad. On the back of the picture of the United States was a picture of a little boy. And you put the little boy together right, and you put the country together right. <laughs> Today, young people have more challenges facing them and their character and corrupting their character than ever before. And the Boy Scouts of America stands ready to work with you and your organization and ISNA to develop character, citizenship, and personal fitness in our young people. Last year at this meeting, we signed a memorandum of mutual support, pledging our support for ISNA in working with young folks. As a result of that, over 100 new scouting programs in Muslim communities were started. That's good news, but it's not enough. Our goal is to double that with Cub Scouting programs, Boy Scouting programs, and Venturing programs. We're here this weekend to help you start scouting programs and make the difference in the lives of young folk. In a village there lived an elderly, wise old man. And also in this village were two young boys. And they said, they conspired, and they said, let's capture a little bird and put this little bird in our hand. And we'll go up to the wise old man and say, wise old man, is this bird dead or alive? And the, if the wise old man says that it's alive, we'll crush the bird and show him that it was dead. And if the wise old man said the bird is dead, we'll open our hands and let the bird go. And so they went to the old man with the bird in hand. And they said, wise old man, in our hand we have a bird. Is it alive or dead? And the wise old man said, its future is in your hands. Your children's future is in your hands. Thank you. My apologies for rushing you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, وَتَعَوَّنُ عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّخْوَى وَلَتَعَوَّنُ عَلَى الْإِسْمِ وَالْأَدْوَانِ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْإِقَابِ Help one another in righteousness and piety. Do not help one another in sin and transgression. And fear Allah, indeed Allah is severe in punishment. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, Man lam yashkurin nas la yashkurullah. A person who is not thankful to his fellow being cannot be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either. We at Islamic Society of North America are very thankful to the Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago for all their help and support. Please welcome the president of CIOGC and chair of the steering committee and your co-host for this year's convention, Brother Abdul Malik Mujahid. Assalamu alaikum. It was a uh, little less than five years ago when a young man who was a physician in a school and a trained paramedic, he heard in his train that he needed to be someplace to save lives. And that young man, Muhammad, 
rush to World Trade Center. And no one knew where he has gone. His mom was insistent that he must be there trying to save lives. And people thought he was one of the terrorists who had blown up tanks there. It took five months when New York media kept writing that he was one of the terrorists, when finally his DNA was checked out, that he was indeed there to save lives, and finally he was awarded and honored. That, in a way, described the dilemma of Muslims. And it describes to us the challenges we face in our own country. Let me ask you a few questions. How many of you think that America is safer today after five-year wars? Do you think it's safe? Do you think it was a good thing for our, on, the, on behalf of our government to give Israel more time to kill people in Lebanon? Did it save lives? It is important that if any secretary of deputy secretary of any department is still present, to please politely convey how Muslim feel. It is good to have secretary of state, deputy secretary of state for public diplomacy. It's honor to have deputy secretary of defense and deputy secretary of anti-terrorism present amongst the Muslim. But we like to see in future President of the United States consider Muslims to be an asset and come and honor Isna in our convention. Are you with me on that? We Muslims have a voice, but in the respect and honor of our guests, I will limit myself to whatever I have already said. We feel for our country, it's our duty to save our neighbor's life, and we pray that our neighbors open their hearts for us, and we pray that we open our hearts for our neighbors. But America will be safer when we are welcomed on the streets of Karachi, Cairo, as well as in Berlin, as a friends of humanity, not people who dictate policies to them. Sit down for a minute. Thank you. I just like to thank you for coming. And I'm very pleased and honored to see that we have Ingrid Madsen as our president. I just marched two miles in downtown Chicago, who I heard quite a bit of WBBM. And they said, we have a new president of ISNA. And then her voice came far lower than my voice. In humble way, she related to America in a beautiful way. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother uh, Abdul Malik Mujahid. Sorry to rush you. Uh, we, are, we are running a little bit behind the schedule, and I hope you would understand this. Uh, the next speaker is a professor of Islamic studies and director of Islamic chaplaincy at the McDonald Center for Islamic Studies and Christian Muslim Relations at Hartford Seminary in Hartford, Connecticut. She earned her PhD in Islamic studies from the University of Chicago, her research focused on Islamic law and society, and she served ISNA as a vice president for two terms. My dear brothers and sisters, we are all witnessing a very historic moment in the history of this organization. For the first time in last 43 years, we have a woman as its president. Please welcome a prominent scholar, a leader, and a teacher, the president of Islamic Society of North America, Dr. Ingrid Madsen Takbir. I begin in the name of Allah, God, the creator of the heavens and earth, the merciful, the compassionate, and I follow that by asking Allah, 
God to send prayers and blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is our example, our guide, and our hope. The Quran talks about our families as Qurrat al Ain, as what we look out at and cools our eyes, make us feel happy and relaxed. It's that feeling you get when you look out over the ocean and you just relax. You look at the beautiful faces of your children and you feel happy. And that's the happiness that I feel here today looking at you, my brothers and sisters, to be able to come back here. I feel humbled and honored, as always, to be able to stand here and see all of your faces and to see the reflection of those people who have made me what I am. It is by your advice, your support, your guidance that I have been able to learn, that I have been able to understand something about this religion, the beautiful religion of Islam. My Sheikh, <laughs> my Sheikh, Sheikh Mohammed Noor Abdullah, who needs a well-deserved rest after five years of very difficult presidency, uh, working constantly. It's been, it's been uh, a much more difficult job than we imagined. Uh, it's a volunteer position, but it is a full-time, more than a full-time job. And I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guiding me to, to him and to his presence and guidance and knowledge many years ago and to the material cause of that, which is Sheikh Abdullah Idris Saadi, who overlooked this superficially strange costume. I'm not quite sure what I was wearing when I first became Muslim and I was sitting on that, that train thinking I was uh, wearing some kind of Islamic costume coming to the first uh, uh, ISNA convention I'd ever attended. But he saw me and invited me as a sister he didn't know anything about me, to come along with him to the convention, brought me to Sheikh Muhammad Noor, and there I saw so many of our, our great brothers and sisters, people like Dr. Jamal Bedoui, who inspired me immediately and gave me the encouragement and, and hope for a life in this religion and the encouragement to study, study this beautiful religion, this beautiful tradition, and I'm so grateful to all of them. What is ISNA? ISNA is primarily an organization of communities and an organization that is devoted to building community. You know, sometimes people want us to, to provide something much more direct, services, goods, products, buildings. But in the end, what we want to offer is a platform for dialogue, an opportunity for getting to know each other, our community is very diverse. And as leaders of the Islamic Society of North America, we do not claim to represent all of the Muslims in North America. We represent those members who elected us. At the same time, we have a responsibility to every Muslim, whether a member of this organization, someone who agrees with us, those who disagree with us on the most fundamental positions, we still have a responsibility to reach out as brothers and sisters in faith, to encourage dialogue, to listen openly, because we may be wrong. We take positions, we make statements, we offer certain kinds of programming that uh, may in fact not be helpful. Perhaps we've made errors and we've made mistakes and we need to be open to hearing that. At the same time, I do believe that what we can offer, the most valuable thing we can offer, is this methodology of listening, dialogue, and openness. That is what we need to learn as Muslims and to increasingly experience and engage in as Muslims. We live in a time when people are driven to the, to the extremes, to the right or to the left to the far side of conservatism or the far side of liberalism, to feeling that they have to be with any particular uh, administration of this government on everything or completely reject every aspect or every involvement with the government, that we have to be simply on the side of, of the Muslims and everything they do 
or we have to be away from everything they do, and that's not the way. There's good everywhere, there's bad everywhere, and we know as spiritual people that first it begins within our own selves. We have those struggles within ourselves, and the best way for us to become those true Muslims that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that God asks us to be, is to exercise humility in encountering other Muslims. And then to go beyond that and to encounter those other human beings who God has chosen to put on this earth with us as our neighbors, as our co-workers, as fellow citizens. Nothing in this universe happens by accident. Everything is by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are here in this time, whether you feel it to be a difficult time or a time of great opportunity, because God chose you to be here in this time with the abilities you have, with the knowledge you have, with the struggles you have. We need to think deeply about what is required of us in this time. And we need to help each other look to the best within us and improve ourselves. What makes me hopeful for the future in this time of great difficulty is these encounters. And more than anything, this is why I'm deeply grateful to be able to be in a position in this organization where I can meet people. Because everywhere I go, whether it is across the United States and Canada and, and in Muslim communities or in encounters with people of other faiths, I see so much good work being done. I see people of good hearts and good mind who want to make things better. Unfortunately, their efforts, our efforts, are not always being publicized. We hear the bad news and sometimes we become pessimistic and we talk about these things perhaps a little bit too excessively and, and we might not notice the effect this is having on, on our children because some of our children are starting to feel demoralized, feeling a little hopeless, feeling like there's not much of a future for them, that we live in a world of violence and conflict and that is not a world that anyone looks forward to living in. So we need to project a more positive future for them. We need to help them engage in these efforts to build peace and understanding. This is not to be Pollyannish. This is not to say that there aren't any difficulties. But in fact, the unrealistic position, the impractical position, is to say that we are going to solve these conflicts by disengagement. To believe that we can make all of these problems of conflict and misunderstanding go away by simply turning our back away from the problems and keeping within our homes and shutting ourselves off. That is an unrealistic solution. So we need to engage. We need to engage with those people of goodwill. And I believe that this is our obligation as Muslims. You all know that Islam has a concept of a communal obligation, fard kafaya. And that is an obligation that the whole community has to engage in something or provide some service that individuals cannot normally do on their own. It is our communal obligation to make sure that the hungry in our society are fed. It is our responsibility as a community to make sure that there is a mosque that establishes prayer in the community. It is our obligation to make sure that when one of our brothers or sisters passes away, that he or she has a dignified funeral and burial in the Islamic tradition. But how do we as minorities, as a small minority in this large country, fulfill those communal obligations? Can we really say that we have done our job in feeding the poor, and ensuring the rights of the homeless and the rights of those prisoners and others who are being abused if we refuse to engage with people of other faiths and other organizations who are, can be effective, with whom we can be effective to get the work done. It's not enough to simply say we would like to do it, but we don't have the resources. Our obligation is to find the way 
to do the job and complete it successfully. And it is those efforts that will give us hope. You know, uh, just a small story, a few weeks ago I was sitting in a Boston courtroom and I had been asked by a lawyer to give some expert testimony in a religious accommodation case. Two Muslim prisoners who were suing to get, have their rights in the prison, in the correctional institution, so that they could pray Juma prayer every Friday and some other rights for religious accommodation. Uh, you know, these people were obviously convicted of serious crimes. They were Muslims. Uh, they were in jail for a long time. Yet the person who picked up their case because he believes in the dignity of humanity and the obligation of the United States to fulfill its commitment to religious freedom was a Jewish lawyer from Boston who asked me to work with him to provide this expert testimony. And we presented our case in a Massachusetts courtroom. And the judge in that case, a distinguished uh, man from Massachusetts, uh, Christian, clearly, listened to us and listened to our argument. And alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us success in that case. And to me, that showed the best of this country, that you could have a Muslim and a Christian and a Jew working together, bringing all of their expertise and their desire for justice to bring rights to the least of the people in our society, to the people who have the least resources to claim their rights. There are many of those people in the society. We need to reach out to them. We need to form that axis of good together with our, our, uh, our neighbors and the people in our society. Let me just say that, um, do you know how much time we have? Five minutes? Let me just say finally that, as I expressed at the beginning, we consider this convention to be one of the instruments for facilitating dialogue. I'm chair of the program committee this year, and believe me, I wouldn't go to every session in this convention. Not every topic interests me. Um, I don't agree with the positions of all of the speakers. At the same time, I believe that it's our obligation to offer that platform so that we can engage and we can listen. And when we bring speakers to this convention, it's for that purpose, not to endorse uh, everything they say, not to endorse every policy that they uphold, but to say we're part of this country, we have a right to ask questions, uh, we're not shy to consider ourselves um, uh, supportive or opposing any particular policy or position, whether within the Muslim community or outside. But I would like to say that as Muslims, we, we do insist that we are not only concerned about, about uh, outreach and nice words, but we're very concerned that there's a serious effort to, to um, meet our expectations in a very practical way. And what I mean by that is there are some terms that are undermining the ability of our community to present ourselves. There's some forms of dialogue and discourse that in fact undermine the ability of people in this country, all of us, to work together because they sow fear and anxiety. So I would like to say that, that uh, we do not support a term like Islamic fascism applied to any kind of criminal action. Uh, we do not support Islam associated with these terms. And in that place, I suggest that people look around at this convention and start to apply the term Islamic to other things as an adjective to other aspects of our society. What about Islamic art? At this convention, you will see an art exhibit. You will see a film exhibit. What about Islamic culture? We have books. We have film. We have even comedians and singers. What about Islamic social services? These are the terms that should come off the tip of our tongue. And you will look around and you will hear 
from our brothers and sisters who are working in the social service sector and providing uh, out of their generosity and compassion services to all of those people. The majority of them are not Muslim, but in neighborhoods just out of the obligation of Muslims to be a compassionate presence in society. Islamic ethics, we have doctors and others who are in the middle of these discussions about what is the ethical approach and Islam has, an, has a solution to that. Islamic medical clinics, Islamic relief, Islamic charity. This community is one of the most charitable communities you could find on the face of the earth. We know that from all of the disasters that have happened in the past few years and the incredible overwhelming generosity of our brothers and sisters. And it's that generosity and charity, that spirit that we see in Muslims across the world. And everywhere there is trouble, we see Muslims stepping up and filling in. In Pakistan, the first responders were the poorest people in Pakistan who, who brought whatever small thing they had to those mountains. It was not major government agencies who were in the first place. That is the Islamic way. Islamic celebrations, Islamic intellectuals. You will see here many thinkers who can present different and sometimes compo uh, competing views on the same subject. And that shows that we believe in dialogue and openness and we're open to debate and changing our mind. An Islamic peace movement, Islamic human rights. This is the proper adjective. Uh, Islam is the proper adjective for all of these activities and all of these segments of society. This is who we are, and this is who, uh, what represents us. This convention is a mirror of our values, not just the values of the American Muslim community, but of Muslims worldwide. We have been blessed by God with more resources and more opportunities than most Muslims in the world. We did nothing to deserve that. That is only by the graciousness of God to put us in that situation. With each opportunity and with each increased blessing, it increases our responsibility. And that's why we are not a parochial community. We are not a community that cares only about ourselves. We do care about the rest of the world. At the same time, without denying our obligation and our commitment, our full engagement in this, in this society that, that we live in. Uh, with that, I just want to thank you for your patience. I want to, uh, we went a little bit overboard. I pray that you enjoy this convention, um, that you benefit from it, that uh, you continue to give us advice, the executive of this organization, our Medjlis, and, and be part of us. We are only what you wish us to be. Uh, this is your organization and we are here uh, at your service. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless your families. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Ingrid. Inshallah, we look forward to work under your uh, able leadership. Dear attendees, without your participation, none of our efforts would be of any use. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. You all have been a wonderful audience. Thank you for being so patient with us. I know we have been running a little bit behind the schedule. Have a pleasant weekend of learning, fellowship, and sharing in the hospitality of Chicago.